thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> I appreciate the way it's you've conducted really these nice hearings, and in spite of these type of irresponsible outbursts and so forth, uh, it's hard to believe. Now, Judge Kavanaugh, I'd first like to commend you for how you've conducted yourself these last two days. Uh, you have displayed the level-headedness and decency that so many of your friends tell us uh, actually exist. And I, I would say your friends and foreign colleagues have described in their letters to this committee. I wish you could say the same about everyone who's attended this hearing or conveyed it uh, or covered it on social media, uh, but I can't. I'm deeply concerned about the theatrics we've seen these last two days. I've been on this committee for 42 years, longer th than any other person except Senator Leahy. I'm the former chairman. Never have I seen the constant interruptions we witness at this hearing. Confirmation hearings are supposed to be an opportunity for the American people to hear from the nominee. Unfortunately, it seems that some on the political left have decided to try to turn this hearing into a circus. Now, I worry about the precedent this is setting for future confirmations, <coughs> but that's not the worst. Now, the worst of it are the attacks against people who aren't, aren't even up for confirmation, who just happen to be here in the room to support the nominee. It's bad enough that Supreme Court nominations have turned into all-out war against the nominee. Have we really reached a point where anyone who supports or even sits behind a nominee must also be destroyed? Has our tribalism really reached that low? To those who have been unfairly caught up in the mob mentality of the last two days, I just want to say you're right to be here supporting someone you believe in. Don't let the fact that there are a lot of, uh, frankly, sick people out there cause you to lose faith in our political process. We need good, decent people to step forward to contribute even when it's ugly, particularly when it's ugly. Just now to my questions, let me ask you this. As I did yesterday, I'd like to ask you to keep your answers to my questions concise so we can get through as many of them as we can. Late last night, one of my colleagues asked you a series of open-ended questions about any conversations you have had with anyone at a 350-person law firm about special counsel Bob Mueller or his investigation. You said you do not remember having had any such conversations. My colleague did not clarify why my colleague was asking the questions and did not allow you to complete your answers. I want to give you a chance to respond, if you'd like to. Sure, Senator. I, I don't recall any conversations of that kind with anyone at that law firm. I didn't know uh, everyone who might work at that law firm, uh, but I, I haven't had, uh, don't recall any conversations of that kind. I haven't had any inappropriate conversations about that investigation with anyone. I've never given anyone any hints, forecasts, previews, winks, nothing about uh, my view as a judge or how I would rule as a judge on, on that or anything related to that. Uh, so I uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to clarify and, and reassure you on that. Well, thank you. With all of the accusations and insinuations and innuendo being hurled around yesterday, there's something I have to come clean about. I'm on the Board of Visitors of the Federal Society. It's true. For those who are not familiar with the Federal Society, it generally holds debates and puts together panels on legal issues covering all sides of these issues, the liberal, the conservative, et cetera. It's a very responsible organization. The American Constitution Society, the Democrat organization, does much the same thing, and I respect them, except it focuses on liberal or progressive lawyers. So this is familiar to my Democratic colleagues on this committee. They've been involved with ACS's, uh, with the ACS from keynoting the annual conference to being an honorary host committee chair, to speaking on panels, to writing blog entries for the organization. I even heard a nasty rumor that one of them spoke at a Federalist Society event. Can you believe that? You've already said that when it came to your nomination, you spoke with the president, the vice president, and the White House counsel, Don McGahn, not the Federalist Society. So I don't need to ask you about that. My question for you is this. What has your experience with the Federalist Society, Society been? 
Senator, thank you. Uh, the Federal Society, as you note, provides, uh, holds debates at law schools. On both sides. On both sides. The typical program of a Federal Society event at a law school will have two speakers and a moderator that's typical with the two speakers presenting different views on an issue. It could be, for example, Fourth Amendment privacy, where you have someone who's uh, got a different view on national security related Fourth Amendment issues or on free speech issues or uh, all sorts of legal issues. They try to have debates where both sides are presented at the law school events that I've been to. At the conventions, they'll always have panels of four or five with a moderator where they'll ha have a spectrum of views represented on a different topic. They're very uh, enriching in terms of your knowledge of the law. And they're also enriching, I believe, in terms of providing different perspectives on the law. And they have they welcome people and actually uh, insist on having people from all different perspectives at the event. So it is uh, very beneficial to the law. I think the programs they have at the law schools they're uh, very educational. They provide some of the best debates that are held at the law schools, I believe. And so I think the organization, which itself does not lobby and does not file amicus briefs or anything like that, does a very valuable service at law schools and the legal community as a whole for bringing together different views on important legal issues. And uh, I, I applaud them for their efforts to bring speakers to campus and provide legal debates on campus and in lawyers' conventions. You've described it quite well. Earlier this year, I attended oral argument in Microsoft versus United States, also known as the Microsoft Ireland case. Naturally, I was very interested in that. At issue in the case was the meaning of the Stored Communications Act and whether a warrant for data stored overseas but accessible in the United States falls within the Act's confines. I had introduced uh, legislation known as the Cloud Act to resolve this issue. Following oral argument, Congress passed the Cloud Act, thus mooting the case before the court. Now, the specific question at issue in the Microsoft Ireland case has been resolved by my legislation, but the case also raised a broader question that I'd like to ask you. When the Stored Communications Act was passed in 1986, no one imagined a world where data could be stored overseas but accessible instantaneously in the United States. It was clear that the act covered uh, data stored in the United States, but it was less clear that it extended to data stored abroad using new technologies that were not available in 1986. How do we interpret our laws in light of changing technology? How do we determine whether the authors and enactors of legislation would have intended the legislation to cover new technologies and unforeseen situations? Senator, I think there, as elsewhere, the job of a judge is to focus on the words written in the statute passed by Congress. Sometimes Congress will write a statute where the words are very precise and it's quite clear it covers only something that might be in existence at the time. Sometimes Congress will write broader, more capacious words, uh, as does the Constitution at times, uh, that can apply to new technologies. Uh, for example, the Fourth Amendment, of course, in the Constitution applies to uh, uh, things that were not known at the founding, including uh, cars and, and communication devices that were not known at the founding. So too with statutes, it depends on how broadly or narrowly you've, you've written it. And your question raises a broader point, which is the issue of uh, privacy and liberty on the one hand versus uh, security, law enforcement on the other, is an enormous issue going forward for the Congress in the first instance, I believe, and also for the federal courts, including the Supreme Court going forward. The Carpenter case this past term is a good example of that, written by Chief Justice Roberts. Right. And as I look ahead over the next 10 to 20 years, that balance of Fourth Amendment liberty and privacy versus security and law enforcement is an enormous issue. Well, I appreciate your elucidation on that. On the domestic front, 
There's been debate for some time now in Congress about whether our laws should, uh, should, be, uh, uh, should be updated to require a, a warrant for the content of electronic communications, regardless of how old those communications are. As you may know, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act currently distinguishes between communications that are less than 180 days old and, uh, old and those that are more than 180 days old, requiring a warrant for the former, but not the latter. Can you speak generally to the importance of warrant requirements and why they're an important bulwark against the government overreach? The warrant requirement helps, helps ensure uh, as a general matter, that the executive branch is not unilaterally uh, able to invade someone's privacy, someone's liberty without judicial oversight that ensures that there's probable cause or whatever the standard might be in a statutory situation to uh, it, get someone's records or information or otherwise invade their liberty or privacy. So that judicial oversight is part of the checks and balances of the Constitution, and Congress has written that also into several statutes, as you know, Senator. You've been critical of the practice of judges sentencing defendants based on uncharged or acquitted conduct. With regard to acquitted conduct in particular, I agree that the notion that a judge can sentence a defendant to a long prison term for a crime that a jury uh, acquitted the defendant of flies in the face of the right to a jury trial. You've written that you believe, quote, it likely will take some combination of Congress and the Sentencing Commission to systematically change federal sentencing to preclude use of an acquitted or uncharged conduct, unquote. Why do you take issue with the use of acquitted conduct at sentencing? And why do you believe this is an issue that will likely require intervention by Congress to resolve? The um, opinions I've written on this, and I've written several, say, in essence, the following, Senator. When a criminal defendant, for example, let's say is charged with uh, 10, 10 counts, let's suppose, and is acquitted on nine and convicted on one, and then the criminal defendant is sentenced as if he or she had been convicted of all 10, because the judge just says, well, uh, I, I think you, know, you did X or that Y, and under my discretion, which you now have under the Supreme Court's case law for sentencing, I'm just going to sentence you the same anyway. Uh, defendants and the public, the families of the defendants, understandably say that seems unfair. I thought the point of the jury trial was to determine whether I was guilty or not guilty on all those charges. And if I'm getting sentenced ex as exactly as if I were guilty on all the charges, that seems a violation of due process. So I've written about the fairness and perceived fairness of the use of acquitted conduct at sentencing. I've uh, Judge Millett on my court and I have both written about it several times and made clear our concern about the use of acquitted conduct and how it affects the sentencing uh, system. Why I've said Congress uh, might need to look at it, although I've also pointed out individual district judges can, can look at it, is because under the current system, sentencing judges have wide discretion in picking sentences, so it's hard for a appeals court to say, uh, that you've uh, infringed your discretion given some of the case law of the Supreme Court which grants that discretion. But I don't like the practice, and I've made that clear in my opinions, so I'm just repeating my opinions here because of the unfairness and perceived unfairness of it. Okay. This committee has been chasing an elusive deal on criminal justice reform for quite some time now. One particular focus of mine in this area has been mens rea reform. Without adequate mens rea protections, that is, without the requirement that a person know his conduct was wrong or unlawful, everyday citizens can be held criminally liable for a conduct that no reasonable person would know was wrong. Critics of my legislative efforts to bring clarity to mens rea requirements claim the effort is a ploy to get corporations and white-collar defendants off the hook. But stronger mens rea requirements protect the liberty of all defendants in the criminal justice system, the vast majority of whom are not corporations or white-collar defendants. You've written about the importance of mens rea requirements, including 
in cases involving unsympathetic defendants like an armed robber or a convicted murderer. Why, in your view, are mens rea requirements so important? Mens rea requirements are important, but because, Senator, under the Due Process Clause and the precedence of the Supreme Court, it is not right to convict someone based on a fact they did not know. It's just an elemental point of due process. Justice Jackson described this principle uh, in his famous Morissette decision that he wrote. Uh, it's as elementary as the, he said, as the school child's, I didn't mean to, I didn't know. And if it, someone truly didn't know a fact that they, um, uh, that's relevant to their conviction to nonetheless convict them uh, is a contrary to due process. I've seen cases where a, a mandatory minimum sentence was elevated from 10 years to 30 years, 30 year mandatory minimum based on a fact that the defendant did not know. I dissented in that case in an in-bank case joined by Judge Tatel, who was an appointee of President Clinton to our court, uh, saying that, and I wrote a very lengthy dissent about the history of mens rea and just how uh, much of a violation of due process I thought had occurred in that case. That was not a, a sympathetic defendant, you know, given what he had been convicted of, but I thought it was a complete violation of due process and pr principles of mens rea that were longstanding from Morissette to give him a 30-year mandatory minimum for a fact uh, he did not know. I have also wrote or joined an opinion and wrote a separate opinion reversing a murder conviction of someone who, where the jury instructions were unclear about the mental state of the, uh, of the murder. It was a question of manslaughter versus second degree murder. That would have had a huge difference in the defendant's sentence. And I uh, wrote an opinion saying this was not an especially sympathetic case, given the facts, but the jury instructions were flawed on the issue of the mental state. And I, my exact line was, I'm unwilling to sweep that under the rug. And that's how I felt about the, that case. There was a dissent in that case, but I was in the majority reversing the murder conviction in that case. No matter who you are in my court, if you, uh, uh, if you have the right um, argument on the law, uh, I'm going to rule in your favor, and mens rea is foundational to due process. I've written that repeatedly, and I uh, share your concern about mens rea reform, uh, Senator Hatch. Well, thank you. I have one last question. Some people seem to think that religious people should not work in government because they swear allegiance to their church, not their country necessarily. I have faithfully served in this country for over 40 years, and I'm a, I believe I'm a religious person. Now, religion is also a big part of your life. You went to Catholic school, your children go to Catholic school, and you regularly attend church and serve a church-supported uh, church soup kitchen. I know that religious faith is a personal subject, but I'd like to hear from you how, you how your private beliefs affect your public decisions. Can you be devout in your faith and still uphold the law? Senator, my religious beliefs uh, have no relevance to my judging. I judge based on the Constitution and laws of the United States. I take an oath to do that. For 12 years, I've lived up to that oath. At the same time, of course, as you point out, uh, uh, I, am, uh, I, have, I am religious and I am a Catholic and I grew up attending Catholic schools. And uh, the Constitution of the United States foresaw that religious people uh, or people who are not religious are all equally American. As I've said in one of my opinions, the New Dow opinion, no matter what religion you are or no religion at all, we're all equally American. And the Constitution of the United States also says in Article 6, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust on, under the United States. That was an important provision to have in the founding Constitution to ensure uh, that there was not discrimination against people who had a religion or people who didn't have a religion. It's a foundation of our country. We're all equally American. Well, Senator, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Senator Leahy. 